Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, we're gonna continue our series that's called What's Next? We've been talking over the last several weeks about, uh, about how in every one of us, whether you've been around the church forever or you're new to the life of faith, we have those moments where we wonder, what's next? We wonder there must be more. We've been talking about all the things that God wants for us and the ways we can grow deeper in our faith. But today, I'm gonna to talk about one thing one thing that gets in the way, gets in the way of us knowing God, of us finding freedom. It gets in the way of us discovering our own purpose and us making a difference in the world. Hey everybody, today we are in week five of a worship series that we've called What's Next? What's Next? Whether you consider yourself a religious person, you've been around the church, or, or, or maybe you're new to the life of faith, we all have those moments in our lives where we wonder what's next. We wonder, there, there must be more to the life of faith. And so after, over the last four weeks, we've been talking about four things, four things we believe God wants for people like you and people like me. Four things we find in, in the writings of the biblical authors again and again. And those four things look like this. First off, four weeks ago, we began talking about how what God wants for us is that we would know God. But for some of us, that is really hard because there are sort of masks that have been placed over God, masks of religion, masks of politics, masks uh, of religious divisiveness. And in order for you to know God, you've got to peel off those masks in order to understand and come to know a God who loves you unconditionally. And once we know God, what God wants for us is that we would find freedom. We all have a past. We all have pains. We all have problems that grab a hold of of us and they don't let go and God wants to free us from all of that and once we know God and we find freedom then God wants us to discover purpose and we talked about how finding purpose isn't about a strategy it's about surrender it's about letting go and knowing that God uses us just the way we are and this last week last week we talked about how we all want to make a difference that's our ultimate calling and so together once we know God we find freedom discover purpose and together as a church we can make a difference in the world but today I want to talk to you about something that I believe gets in the way of all of this it's something that gets in the way of us knowing God uh, because instead of knowing God and worshiping God, we worship this thing. Because rather than finding freedom, this thing robs us of freedom. It grabs a hold of us and builds anxiety and fear inside of us. It keeps us from discovering purpose and making a difference in this world. And there's a problem with this thing we're going to talk about not just today, but for the next three weeks weeks that once I tell you what this thing is that we're going to talk about my fear is that you're going to quit listening or maybe you're going to say we're going to skip church for the next three weeks because the thing that we're going to talk about for the next three weeks is this money money how many of you like to talk about money the only people who like to talk about money are bankers and financial planners here's what I know some of you some of you under your breath have already said this. You've said, why does the church always talk about money? And here's why. The Bible actually talks about money more than any other, any other topic. 
Others of you are probably uh, saying under your breath, well, why does the church always ask for money? And if that's you, here's what I want you to know. You never need to give a cent to this church to be a part of our church. You never need to give a cent to be a part of our church. But, but here's the fact of the matter. You'll never experience the life God wants for you unless you give. Unless you are, live the generous life that God calls us to. Because here's the thing about our wealth that you know is true and I know it's true. You see, here's the deal. We think we have a hold on our wealth, but it's all too often our wealth that actually has a hold on us. And so for the next three weeks, we're going to talk about our relationship, the relationship between our faith, our lives, and our wealth. And to get into this, I want to give a couple of examples of some quirky things that I do that uh, my wife looks at me and she goes, why in the world do you do that? If you're married, you, you know you have things like this. For example, uh, when I go on vacation, uh, I always come home with a new baseball cap. It's just something that I do. And when my wife asks me, why in the world do you need another ball cap? You have enough ball caps for every person in our church. Do you know what my response to her is? My response to her is something like this. It's just what I do. huh? Or how about this? This time of year, we live here in the lakes area. And this time of year, we're winterizing our boats. And people will often say to me, you know, you can hire someone to do that for you. Why do you do it yourself? My response is simply, it's just what I do. Uh, a friend of mine told me a story about her family. Every Easter when the women got together to make the Easter ham, they had this, this thing that they did that no one quite understood. They would cut the end of the ham off the ham before they put it in the oven. For generations, the women in this family had been doing this. Well, one of the in-laws came into the family and, and being young, she said, why do we do this? Why do you cut the end of the ham off the ham? And you know what the women said? We have no idea. But here's what they said. That's just what we do. You see, we all have these sort of quirky things, these things we do that we've never really explored why it is that we do them. They're just what we do. And I think similarly, when it comes to our relationship to our wealth, there are things that we just do that are sort of quirky if we were to step back and look at them. Uh, for example, when I was a kid, I was a paper boy. And, and do you know what day of the week I hated delivering papers? <laughs> Sunday. Why? Because the Sunday paper was this thick. Over a half of the paper was filled with flyers and, and advertisements. Why? Because the national pastime in America isn't baseball, it's shopping. Why do we love to shop so much in America? I think if you were to ask the average person, they say, well, that's just what we do, huh? Or how about this? In 1990, the average credit card debt in a home was about $3,000. Today, it's somewhere between eight and $9,000. If you were to ask someone, why, why all the credit cards? I think most of us would say, well, that's just what we do. Uh, today, uh, when you take out a loan for a car, do you know that 89% of Americans take out a loan uh, for an automobile purchase that's at least four years in length? Do you know that 55% of, of, of Americans take out a loan that's at least five years in length? And did you know that you can take out a loan for an automobile that is eight years in length? Why all this automobile debt? Well, that's just what we do. Uh, in the year 20, uh, excuse me, 1973, the average size of a home was about 1,600 square feet. By 2004, the average size of a home was 2,400 square feet. In America, we believe when it comes to homes, bigger is better. Why? Well, that's just what we do. Since 2004, Get this, the, size of, the average size of homes, though, actually has stayed the same. It's stayed the same. Do you know why? 
It's not because we are accumulating less. In fact, we're accumulating more than ever before. It's because of this. We all rent storage garages. Do you know in America there are more storage garages than there are McDonald's, Starbucks, Wendy's, Dunkin' Donuts, and Pizza Hut's combined? When asked why all the storage garages, well, that's just what we do. And I point all this out because, not because the problem is with our wealth, it's not with our stuff, it's not with our bigger houses, it's not with our storage garages. The problem with all of this is our relationship to our wealth. The problem is this, the wealth we think we control, it actually controls us. It actually controls, it has a hold on us. In the book of John, Jesus says these words. He says, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Too often our relationship with wealth, it robs us. It robs us of the joy and the peace because we're always anxious. We're always worried. We're always fearful that we're not keeping up. Well, by contrast, if you were to survey the generosity of the people of the biblical world, you'd notice something very different from our culture today. You would find an amazing sense of generosity. You, you would look at the generosity of the biblical world and go, that is just insane. There's no way I could live that life. And if you were to ask those ancient people why they were so generous, do you know what I imagine they'd say? They'd say this, well, that's just what we do. You see, I want to paint a picture for you of what generosity looked like in the biblical world. First off, right off the top, every ancient person would give what was called a tithe. What's a tithe? A tithe would be a gift of 10% every, of everything you produced. Every cow you, you gave that you was given birth to on your farm, every bushel of grain, every dollar that came through your door, you would give a tenth of that to the temple. The Bible talks about this in several different places. For example, in Malachi, it says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. The temple would have a storeroom where it'd store all the, the tithes that people would bring. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Food to give to the poor and the hungry. Elsewhere, it says this about the tithe. In Leviticus, it says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth to the value of it. What are they talking about? If you were to give rather than the cattle and the bushels of grain, and instead you would, you would give cash, you would actually give even more to the temple. It says you would give a fifth more. Every tithe of the herd and the flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. Right off the top, people would give 10% to the temple. Why? Well, if you were to ask them, they'd say, that's just what we do. That's just what we do. In fact, that 10% is actually a bit of a mis misnomer. In that ancient world, people would, would give almost a quarter of, of all they produced in a year away. Do you know what they called the, the percentage they would give above and beyond a tithe? They called that their offering. You see, the biblical authors rarely harped on people about generosity. Why? Because generosity, well, that's just what we do. That's what they understood. Regularly, they would harp on people for how they neglected to care for their neighbor, how they would neglect getting their hands dirty with the poor and the oppressed. In fact, Jesus regularly harps on the Pharisees. He says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! 
You give a tithe. You give your tithe. We all do. That's just what we do. You give your tithe of spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You see, giving a tithe, why, why didn't the biblical authors harp on people for generosity? Well, generosity was just what they did. So in the little time I have left with you today, here's what I want to wonder. Why? Why was generosity in that ancient world just what you did. And I want to suggest today that those ancient people understood something about generosity that you and I, well, you and I could learn something from. It's something about generosity that freed them and they knew they needed it unlike anything else. Jesus illustrates this in a story from the book, from the book of Mark. He says this, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, the man said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? When he says eternal life, what he's really talking about is, Jesus, I want the life that you want for me. I want a life filled with hope and freedom and joy, a, a life that begins right now and goes for eternity. Now listen to what Jesus says to him. You know the commandments, Jesus said. And then he, he, exp he shares with him the commandments that specifically have to do with relationships. You see, for Jesus, the life God wants for us always involves relationships. He says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father, father and mother. And what does the young man then say to Jesus? He says this, Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. He says, I have done all that. I know my commandments. I have lived a faithful life. I have a wonderful wife at home. I have 2.5 kids. I've invested wisely. I have done all the right things all the time. And yet, there's something missing. Jesus, there must be something more. And that's when Jesus does this. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then he said this. He said, I, one thing you lack. He says, there's one thing that's keeping you back from the life that I want for you. There's one thing, he said. He said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. And listen to the man's response. It just simply says, At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Even right there, face to face with Jesus. It's his wealth that, that gets in the way. It's got a hold on him. He can't possibly think of giving it away because it's how he measures his importance in the world. You see, I think those ancient people knew, knew the power of wealth, the power that wealth has to hold on to us and mess with our minds. It, it has us afraid. It has us nervous. It has us uh, never feeling the sort of peace, experiencing the life God wants for us. You see, in that ancient world, the people were incredibly generous. And if you were to ask them, why are you so generous? They would say, well, that's just what we do. Paul tries to explain why. He says this, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. What is Paul saying? He's not saying that the more you give, the more you will get, the bigger your bank account will become. No, I think he's saying something like this. When we give, we realize how much we've been given. You see, I think when those ancient people 
If you were to ask them, why are you so generous? They'd certainly say, that's just what we do. And, and it was just what they did because they realized that the tool God has given us to realize how, how blessed we are, the tool God's given us is generosity because when we give away, we can't not know that we have more, we have more than enough. He said, for them, that's just what we do. Now, friends here at Calvary, here's what I wonder. What would it be like if we were like those ancient people, a community, and when people looked at us, they said, why are those people so darn generous? What if we were able to respond by saying, well, that's just what we do? Pack thousands of bags of food. Why do you do that, Calvary? Well, that's just what we do. Invite hundreds of kids to vacation Bible school absolutely free. Entertain them for a week and fill them with the love of Jesus. Why do you do that? Well, that's just what we do. Pay for the entire tuition of anybody who wants to go to seminary from our church. Why do you do that? Well, that's just what we do. Why do you, you give away and pack all the food for, for the high school food shelf? Why would you start a food shelf in the high school? Well, that's just what we do. Why would you help other churches by sharing the resources we have? That's just what we do. Hey, it's Halloween time. And so I, I could not have a little Halloween in our uh, service today. And I got two pumpkins. My kids helped me carve this one. But this one, we just cut the top off. And at our house, there are three jobs. Somebody has the knife and is the cutter. Somebody is the one to design the face. The other is the one to scoop the muck and yuck out. And nobody wants that job. And as I thought about carving these pumpkins, I thought about how this pumpkin is filled with all kinds of muck and yuck. And isn't that how we are when our relationship to wealth is just off? Uh, we get filled with muck and yuck. We get filled with anxiety. We get filled with worry. We get fear, filled with fear that we're not keeping But then you got this pumpkin over here and we've scooped all the muck and yuck out of it. And I think when our relationship to our wealth, when we've got that in sync, when we understand the call to generosity, it's like scooping all the muck and yuck out. And when we scoop the muck and yuck out at our house on Halloween, we take and we light a candle and we stick it in the jack-o'-lantern. And then when it gets dark outside and all the trick-or-treaters come, you know what happens. At night, the, the jack-o'-lantern, it glows. It gives off light. And here's what I know. When we live the sort of generous light God calls us to, when our relationship to our wealth is in sync, here's what happens. We not only know God, but through our generosity, we help others know God. We not only find freedom for ourselves, but we help others find freedom. We not only discover our purpose, but we're able to help other people discover their purpose. And we not only make a difference in the world, but we help others make a difference in the world as well. So today I've got a few questions for you to ponder uh, as we close today. The first question is this. In what ways have your worries about wealth kept you from the abundant life that God wants for you? We all have worries and woes about our wealth. Second question is this. How does giving remind you how much you've been given? How does that happen in your life? And lastly, how do we become people for whom generosity, well, that's just what we
Bring the broken back to life. Only you can, only you can. You set me free from every chain. You fill my heart with songs of praise. Only you can, only you can. Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. Is calling, every beat is calling out today. You left the glory of your throne to bring this runaway back home. Only you, only you can. You give me. Give me life, you keep me dancing through the night. Only you can, only you can. My heart beats only for your glory. My hands reach up for you to hold me. My soul sings. Father, you are holy. My feet dance to rhythm, to rhythm. Every beat is calling. Every beat is calling out. You're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I'm wide awake. You move me, your freedom is consuming. I feel it rushing through me. I'll never be the same. My heart beats. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Let us close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to worship today. Uh, we're so grateful. In fact, if this is your first time with us, I hope you know that our hope and prayer is that today is not your last time with us. Hey, if you're new to Calvary, there's something we'd love for you to do. The best way to get connected with what's going on here at Calvary is to go out to our website, calvaryalec.org. And there, hit the button that says sign up for emails. Every week we send out an email that shares with you all that's going on in the life of the church. It's the best way for you to find your place here at Calvary. Hey, the second thing I'd like to share with you is if you ever find yourself in the Alexandria community and you're not from around here, we'd love for you to join us for in-person worship. We have two services on Sunday morning, one at 8.30, one at 10.30, and two services on Wednesday evening, one at 5.30 and one at 6.30. We'd love for you to join us. And last but certainly not least, if you consider yourself a member of our church family, there's something going on over the next three weeks that we'd love for you to be a part of it. You see, we're in the midst of a giving appeal. We're inviting those who can call Calvary their church home to consider what kind of gifts they'll give in terms of offerings in the next year. 
And so we invite you to go out to our website, calvaryalec.org, and hit the Give button, and there you can sign up for automated giving for the coming year. If you'd like to fill out a pledge card, we'll be sure to get you one. Just call us here in the church office. If, if your name is in our database, you would have received already a packet of information that we invite you to look through and join us as we make our commitments to all God is doing through our church in the coming year. Hey, last but not least, uh, I want to say thank you for your generosity. It's because of your generosity that God is blessing so many people, so many lives through our church. And so today, you can make your offering in one of several ways as found on the screen. First off, you can go to our website, hit the, the button that says give, and there you can make your one-time or reoccurring gift. You can make a gift via Venmo if you'd like to give in that way. It's quick and it's easy. Uh, you can also simply write a check and send it here to the church office. The address is on the screen. And if you're not sure how to make your gift, just feel free to give us a call and we'd love to help you live the generous life God calls people like you and people like me too. Have a great week.